I am thrilled to host first Ian Forrester, now moving on to the substance of issues. And uh, the first order of business is cartels. And Ian Forrester will be talking to us about the philosophy of it, the ethics issues, the discussions about the uh, compliance matters, the leniency aspects of things, and the punishment and the punishment philosophy. And I think you're going to agree with me that whenever he speaks, it's quite a delicious uh, affair. And I'm very happy to host him uh, as a judge uh, for uh, a very long period of my time. He has been my mentor. So I have been doing competition law for 18 years. And since 2002, I have directly known him as my mentor and I have learned from him. Um, of course, him becoming a judge uh, is a bit of a, a hurdle uh, in that now. Uh, but then again, uh, he uh, uh, was very kind and gracious to uh, uh, agree to be here with us and uh, uh, share his thoughts and uh, his uh, opinions on different matters, which I'm sure you're going to find very progressive. Let me begin by making two very obvious uh, propositions. One is that the thriving state of Turkish competition law uh, and the thriving state of our hosts, uh, these are made clear by this phenomenal occasion. Uh, it's really wonderful to see so many people pursuing a topic that some years ago would have been regarded as a trifle obscure and without great significance. Um, the second observation is equally obvious. Um, I was, uh, a few months ago, um, a practitioner like other practitioners, um, and uh, I went to conferences and I had the pleasure of working with talented young lawyers, <coughs> including Gurnich, and uh, enjoying myself losing cases in court. And uh, I used to say that I was the um, world's most exceptionally, extraordinarily unsuccessful competition lawyer because no one in human history had ever seen their clients find as many billions of euros as I had. Um, then, just a few um, months ago, uh, I became uh, a judge in Luxembourg. And um, uh, it has been only uh, four months. So please uh, remember uh, of the judges in Luxembourg I may be the oldest in years, which is true, but I am also the most junior. And so nothing that I say uh, should be given any particular weight uh, by reason of my current employment. These are just the thoughts of a scholar. Now, Gernensch asked me to talk about an area where there are difficult choices to be made and we selected cartels because I think that for practitioners and also for enforcers, cartels are an area where difficult choices um, have to be made uh, in advising and in implementing and enforcing the law and in deciding on controversies. So I begin with a small anecdote, and that is that through a member of my family, I got to know a victim of a cartel. In about 1989, a British man set up a small size company in the retail business trading in certain products. And his business was successful and it grew. And its success attracted the displeasure of two, three large companies. And one of those large companies approached him and said, very sorry, very sorry, but you're going to have to stop. You can't continue uh, working like this because you are reducing our margins and um, you better change your policy. And uh, my friend of my friend uh, said, mm -hmm. and the interlocutor of the cartel said, 
Sorry then. And indeed, four months later, their business had been eliminated. And they sold the stock and they went in search of other jobs. The, um, the boss, whom I was speaking to, wrote to the European Commission and described the events. This is 1989. And he received a letter which he showed me from uh, uh, an extremely able and well-regarded uh, official uh, called Colin Overbury, who said, thanks for your letter, sorry, right now, limited resources, we have to focus, and um, I hope you do okay, but this is not a case the European Commission is going to take up. And then, uh, 15 years after that, the cartel had indeed been discovered, the participants had been fined, and uh, my friend of a friend uh, was endeavoring to get compensation. But we both recognized that his chances of getting anything because of problems of proof uh, were rather remote. And so that tells us cartels did exist in Europe not so many years ago. Now, uh, and the fight against cartels was not very effective for various reasons in Europe at that time. So, where are we today? The world has changed in a number of respects. Uh, one is that international cooperation between enforcement agencies has become absolutely routine. Whereas 25 years ago it might have been a source of jurisdictional tension between the United States and other countries, today that is absolutely a thing of the past. The Japanese, the Canadians, the Australians, the Europeans, the Americans, uh, and more um, uh, countries, including Turkey, routinely cooperate with each other with respect to cartel activity. And second, and this is maybe more relevant to Europe, the prosecution of cartels no longer presents problems of national champions. Uh, in my early days in Brussels in the 70s, uh, one could expect that a government would intervene if one of its key companies was being prosecuted. Um, third, we are moving from a world where cartels were regrettable, uh, maybe a bit immoral, to a situation where in many countries, cartelists are threatened with criminal conduct, with criminal prosecution. I think it's true that as of today, no person in Europe is in jail for a cartel uh, offense, um, but, the, but it will come. Then, leniency programs invented in the 90s, implemented by Europe reluctantly, they have turned out to the surprise of many to be enormously successful. And I'll be saying a word about leniency and the challenges for practitioners um, in, in a moment. Uh, but they have worked extremely well uh, on both sides of the Atlantic in eliciting uh, confessions to the public authority. Then punishment. Punishments, at least in Europe, as imposed by the European Commission, have got more and more and more severe. And sadly, the effectiveness of a commissioner's performance
hiding on uh, cartel uh, follow-on claims. That's an enormous change. So the world has changed a great deal in this particular field of competition law over the past, uh, shall we say, 15 years. And I mentioned leniency programs. We know what a leniency program is. Uh, the idea is if it is discovered that somewhere in your company someone has been having imprudent, unlawful conversations with the employee of a competitor, oops, there is an emergency. What shall we do about it? Shall we stop it and do nothing? That's a possibility. Uh, shall we denounce the individual? Uh, not likely, might be. Uh, or shall we seek leniency? That's to say, approach the public authority and say, we have discovered to our regret that employees of our corporate group have been engaging in this activity. Here are the details. And the European Commission incentivizes uh, the European Commission and all competition, or nearly all competition agencies around the world, including Turkey, I think, incentivize such confessions by saying, if you're first, and if it's complete and thorough and truthful and helpful, then we will not collect, we will not impose any fine upon your enterprise. And if you're second, however, we'll give you a reduction but it will be only a reduction. There will still be a penalty. So the risks for the company, which is discovered or has discovered that conduct is being engaged in, has been engaged in, uh, are enormous. The fines can be in the hundreds of millions of euros when inflicted by the European Commission. Uh, they can be less but they can be absolutely savage. So what to do? And because of the incentive to be first, to make the confession, to seek leniency, the decision has to be made very quickly. It has to be made within a day or two, within a day. In some recent cases, it has happened that the first in the door and the second in the door came on the same day. But the second was the second, and the first was the first. Now, practicing competition lawyers come in all shapes and sizes, and there's lots of them around the world. If you were to ask them to list the factors relevant to deciding whether to seek leniency or not, I think all of them would agree on what the factors were. They're easy to describe. Applying them in a given situation is very difficult and very challenging. So there are, of course, very powerful incentives, factors favoring, let us go and tell the public authority now. And um, of course, that means confessing in a proactive, lawful manner that employees have engaged in illegal conduct. We're drawing a line under it, we're stopping, we will do better in future, and we will take the consequences of our past errors. That is a perfectly principled line to take. Others may say, well, but that means accelerating an adverse outcome. And um, we would have to look more carefully, say other commentators, at the advantages and the burdens. And uh, as I say, it's easy to list the factors, but very delicate and very difficult to apply them in an individual situation. It's one of the most difficult choices for a general counsel or a CEO in the crisis that would follow, discovering that the marketing department had been attending meetings organized with competitors or discovering that uh, price lists were being, were being exchanged, or discovering in the course perhaps of a compliance audit where someone gives guidance on the competition rules and at the drinks afterwards, 
probably not in the plenary session, uh, someone says, it wouldn't be a problem if, would it? Hmm? And of course, what he describes is indeed a problem. So uh, the necessity for speed and careful guidance from experienced counsel and a principal decision on which line to take. These, I think, um, in the context of leniency, are among the most difficult decisions for competition lawyers today. And then there's the question of um, punishment, what level of fine is appropriate, and uh, what level of judicial review is appropriate for those punishments as imposed by the public authority. And there are some uh, interesting judgments uh, which have been emerging over the past three or four years from both of the antitrust courts uh, in Luxembourg. And we, one, one piece of good news is we can see in a number of countries uh, the emergence of an efficient, uh, decent, practical uh, mechanism for the resolution of claims seeking damages. That is to say, uh, the, uh, in particular, the English, German, and Dutch courts for the moment seem to be the most uh, plaintiff and defender friendly in offering a mechanism to decide promptly and to resolve claims by alleged victims of cartels seeking compensation. We're also seeing emerging a phenomenon unimaginable 20 years ago, that's to say insurance policies and investment vehicles where the deal is you go and you say I have a really good claim against makers of widgets and here's my proof and I lost so much money will you fund my litigation and I'll give you a share of what I win 
And those uh, mechanisms, which, as I say, would be unthinkable 20 years ago, are now well-established, almost mainstream, and uh, if you want to invest in something exotic instead of racehorses or shares in Exxon or IBM or other blue chips, you may wish to invest some of your cash uh, in a vehicle which will give lawyers a little bit of income. And then my last thought is uh, we, are talk we talk a lot about criminalization. And as I said at the beginning, I think that at this moment, there is no person who is in jail in Europe for a cartel offense. But there have been a number of prosecutions in England, in Ireland, in France, at different situations, different stories. Uh, but one must expect that as uh, concern about um, anti-competitive, gross anti-competitive practices gets larger and wider, it will be um, uh, natural for uh, national law to look more um, actively at the possibility of using uh, criminal prosecutions in order to pursue the goal of uh, ending uh, cartel practices. So um, I'm delighted that so many people are so interested in such an obscure subject and uh, it's an enormous privilege for all of us to be here and I certainly wish Turkish competition law in general and our generous hosts on this occasion in particular all success. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, for these uh, uh, wonderful remarks. Uh, it's actually a very interesting topic also for the purposes of Turkish competition law uh, because of the international uh, identity of the audience today. We're not particularly going to focus on Turkish competition law matters, but still we've got the majority. So uh, I will from time to time interject with uh, remarks on Turkish competition law uh, side of things. Uh, with the uh, leniency uh, issues especially, we're having a very interesting uh, period of time in Turkey because we've had uh, instances where some people came forward saying, I really have burning evidence and this is uh, a leniency material. And we've had instances where the Turkish competition authority said, um, well, I understand that you're under the impression that you're a party to a cartel but I don't find the cartel. I, I don't think you actually were uh, uh, in a cartel, um, which is not impossible. It happens elsewhere in the world as well, but uh, it shows that um, people were a bit too trigger happy or they went to the authority too quickly sometimes, or sometimes it was just as a safety measure. We've also had instances, which would be interesting also for our colleagues uh, from outside of Turkey, uh, where um, there was a leniency application uh, after the down raids were done and the Turkish competition authority also raided the leniency applicant and found further evidence and then questioned if they should be uh, revoking the leniency status because uh, allegedly the applicant was showing the tip of the iceberg to the uh, Turkish competition authority. Uh, Luckily, the Turkish Competition Authority moved away from that direction and in that very uh, decision, uh, the Turkish Competition Authority decided that they would still grant uh, full immunity. It would have been a disaster in my view for the Turkish leniency program if the Turkish Competition Board uh, did not uh, recognize leniency in those circumstances. Uh, we've also had uh, some instances where um, the leniency applicants got full immunity even after uh, a leniency application done uh, following a down raid. Typically, the Turkish Competition Authority takes the view that if they have the evidence at hand uh, of something, of some wrongdoing, it is falling under Article 4, which is akin to Article 101 of the uh, TFEU. So, uh, TFEU. So we would then have to see um, really uh, this as a cooperation, not as a leniency application. But we've had instances where the Turkish Competition Authority said, no, I'm going to give full immunity. 
We've also had um, the punishment philosophy issues in Turkey. Turkey In the initial years, in the first five years of enforcement uh, of Turkish competition law, we've had instances where, uh, as private practitioners, we would feel that the Turkish competition authority is really calculating a fair amount of administrative monetary fine and then computing the uh, percentage of administrative monetary fine, which should have been uh, the other way around. Uh, you would get, uh, so two million Turkish liras, this is a good amount of fine. And then the, the courts, upon appeal, would ask the Turkish Competition Authority, so what was the, the actual percentage of fine that you have come up with to come up with that two million Turkish liras? And the Turkish Competition Authority would respond to the court, well, we have calculated the administrative fine to be computed on the total of turnover as 0.936832%. Clearly, you don't, you're not coming up with that kind of a percentage. You're first going for the amount of fine, and then you, you're moving into the uh, percentage. Then we have moved away from that uh, more percentage-based fine calculation methodology, which uh, made things a bit more easy in terms of, uh, of discussing fairness of administrative monetary fines, all sitting well into the speech uh, uh, delivered by Ian Forrester.